I'm going to talk on four different areas, on exchange rate policy, on capital flow management, on protectionism, and on global cooperation. One of the classic questions would be uh, for a country, especially for emerging markets and developing countries, is whether to float or not to float, which is do you, what kind of an exchange rate policy do you want to have? Uh, how much flexibility do you want to have? How often do you want to intervene? Is there monetary policy independence with open capital markets? Which exchange rate do you worry about? You know, people care about the, their exchange rate relative to the dollar. Uh, but you could also say, well, you care about your exchange rate relative to your trading partners. So the first thing on to float or not to float. Uh, and here I just want to highlight uh, 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 an important new idea, which is the fact that you know some of the classic arguments for gains to exchange rate flexibility don't really work in the empirical data. Friedman's view of the world was that when Japan sells to the U.S., it sets its prices in yen. When Japan sells to Bra uh, when Brazil sells to Japan, it sets its prices in real. But that's not the world we live in. And the world we live in is one where everybody, pretty much in the world, sells to each other and sets prices in dollars. If you're not the producer of the dominant currency, which if you're not the U.S., you are not that country. Uh, then, it, you know, ex the export expansions following depreciations are weak. Uh, so this kind of would explain a bit of why is it that we see countries with very large devaluations and you don't see any increase in exports. Uh, that doesn't mean that the country and the companies aren't better off. They are better off, but it's all working through markups. They make higher profits, they have higher markups, but they're not selling more quantities uh, in international markets. From a small open economy's perspective, you're an emerging market policymaker. It, the optimal, uh, optimal monetary policy continues to be inflation targeting, but it's just that you have less control of your output gap. At the same time, I want to be very clear, I don't endorse the view of going towards a peg. I think that there are very bad uh, reasons to be at, at, a, at a, a straight peg. And we've seen that from the commodity price collapse, countries that had a floating exchange rate, managed float, did better than uh, ones on a peg. So that comes to my second remark, because there's been a lot of discussion about whether, you know, once you've opened up your capital markets, you just, it's irrelevant whether you have a fixed exchange rate or a floating exchange rate, you just give up monetary policy independence. Uh, that was a, in a very astute observation made by Ellen Ray, where she talked about uh, the existence of a global financial cycle and the fact that all capital flows to all countries go up and go down at about around the same time, and it doesn't matter whether you have a fixed or a floating exchange rate. I believe she is right in a broad, in a broad kind of a general sense, which is the fact that there are large spillovers. But just to make sure that the kind of the pendulum doesn't swing to the wrong extreme. Uh, we just have to recognize the fact that the trilemma still does live on. So what's the trilemma? The trilemma basically says that, uh, you know, countries can choose to have one of the three following three, which is a stable exchange rate, open capital markets and independent monetary policy, but they can't have all three. Uh, the third question was which exchange rates matter? The bottom line is, again, if you look at the data and if you look at how international trade happens, it is not the, your bilateral exchange rate or your trade-weighted exchange rate that drives your trade with the rest of the world, but it is indeed your exchange rate relative to the dollar. What this also means, and this is a bit provocative, it, is, it also means is that uh, when you have, we, we estimate that a 1% US dollar appreciation predicts a rather large negative effect on global trade, on trade across third world countries. Why is it? Because everybody who's importing is importing in dollar terms, and if, every, and if everybody depreciates relative to the dollar, then their demand for uh, imported goods is going to go down. And if that goes down for everybody, that's a decline in overall trade. So now moving on, I want you to now forget about exchange rates and think about capital flows. The first is, I think one of the lessons that we've learned is to go beyond the current account. We've certainly now completely agree that just having focused on the current account, the overall current account, is a problem. We miss the crisis because actually if you look at, while it's true that current account imbalances grew a lot before the crisis, but what was even more stark with the gross flows. And the gross flows grew a lot uh, pre before the crisis, they've come down. Um, 
And those gross flows are very important implications for financial stability reasons besides you know, the straight kind of macro considerations that we think about. It's not just the cross-border gross flows that matter, but the gross flows within the border of the, of the country. There were a lot of uh, European banks that were based in the US that were raising dollar funding in the US and then putting that money back into uh, US uh, mortgage markets and securities. And that's something you would have completely missed if you just saw the cross-border flows. It doesn't show up in the gross cross-border flows, it doesn't show up in the net cross-border flows, but it was a big part of the transmission mechanisms. A second important thing is that we just have a lot more evidence that global banks have internationalized U.S. monetary policy. You know, emerging markets have become more susceptible to uh, uh, monetary and financial conditions in the center. Here is a fact that tells you why they've become a little more insulated from it, which is a good thing and, uh, you know, policy that one should push for, which is that emerging markets have tilted away from foreign currency, local currency debt, uh, which has then actually reduced their exposure to global risk factors. Now, just to be very clear, that shift has happened in the case of sovereign debt flows. Point six, uh, this is to shamelessly plug my own work, uh, which is the fact that uh, you know, low interest rate environments can lead to misallocation of resources and productivity. You see huge amounts of capital flows into Spain before the crisis. Germany sending capital out capital outflows. Uh, and if you look at the path of productivity, you see these nice productivity gains in Germany and this declining productivity in Spain. So if anything, this, if there was ever an allocation puzzle, this would look like an allocation puzzle. Why is capital going from the country that's supposed to have the higher productivity growth to the country that's having the lower productivity growth? And so the paper that we have basically says, actually, the causation goes the other way. It goes from the fact that Spain received all these capital flows, but because it was in a financial system that was that you know, had issues, uh, it got misallocated, not necessarily to the more productive firms, it got misallocated to the to, uh, firms that weren't using it very productively, and that resource misallocation generated this. So just to flag the fact that we, since we're battling with many different reasons for low productivity, low interest rate environments can generate that. I have three points in protectionism. The, you know, we are absolutely at a point where, uh, you know, the chances of something uh, going terribly wrong with the global trade system is, is probably the highest it's ever been since the world wars. There are concerns about how globalization has worked and how it has benefited people. And there's a, certainly a sense in the developed world that you know, the prosperity of the developing countries came at the cost of, of the developed world. And so that has generated reactions in terms of you know, maybe there's been unfair trade practices in different parts of the world. Um, and to tie it to global imbalances, uh, and while I'm completely sympathetic to the idea that global imbalances create challenges uh, and uh, you know, require being taken very seriously, I, I just want to flag that there's been a suggestion that just you know, kind of evidence of, of the fact that countries have been accumulating large amounts of reserves, which is one of the, one of the features of what, what China did pre-crisis, um, actually causally drove the current account improvements of China. But I just don't see the causal link from, uh, from reserves to global imbalances. And if we're going to start uh, altering our trade agreements to have currency manipulation clauses, I think we should just recognize the fact that we're, on a, we're not on the, you know, we, the evidence is still to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be determined. Eight, I'm just going to skip, it's on, it was on the BAT, but the BAT is not happening, so maybe I move on. Uh, point nine, so when we want to look at what, what should we do about, about globalization, the academic research certainly says that trade is not the main driver of earnings inequality, but I think we've done a terrible job with redistribution. Just the two points that I want to make is that the global coordination of financial regulation is required alongside individual country macroprudential policies. I think that's quite obvious because we have global banks. When you have global banks, you, uh, individual countries don't internalize the effects of their there's decisions on the rest of the world. Another new phenomenon that we've seen is we've seen a lot of reserve accumulation by countries. We've seen new currency swap lines. We've seen new regional financial agreements uh, that are you know, trying to provide a global safety net. I completely endorse the development of all these new forms of financing and the new forms of regional monetary funds that we have, uh, but they're not substitutes, but complements.